I, I find that hard to believe. So if I'm hearing you correctly, part of this is the complications of trying to do this in a war-torn area, but also is Assad dragging his field. It's not one or the other. It's a combination of the two. Well, the Syrians are claiming there are security problems and there's logistical problems of moving the weapons to port. Uh, and, and, I mean, everyone knew that could be a, a, a concern, but no one saw that so few weapons would be sent by this point in time. And that's why the experts are looking at this and saying that there, there's more to this than understandable security and logistical problems. You know, Assad also made claims that it wasn't only uh, his regime that was using these chemical weapons. Is there any evidence to indicate that uh, it might be also difficult uh, to deal with this because he might not have control of all the weapons that he's thought to have controlled? I believe that the Syrian regime has control of almost the entire arsenal. There have been some reports that appear credible that some weapons may have been used by the Syrian rebels. It's not, it's not clear what that might involve. That doesn't mean that maybe uh, they detonated a, a, a chemical weapons uh, shell that they came across either deliberately or by accident. We're not sure. Yeah, and we're showing some of the images now of what the people of Syria are going through. And as you indicated, uh, the violence has escalated. Uh, more civilians are dying every single day. A horrible situation. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we'll continue to closely watch the situation in Syria. And while we have you here, Fred, I wanted you to tell us a little bit and fill us in. I know you uh, told me you just returned from Capitol Hill. You were on the Hill for a briefing today about Edward Snowden and the NSA. What would you learn on the Hill today? Well, I'm standing in front of the Capitol. I just left the House Intelligence Committee annual threat briefing from all the senior intelligence officials, and a major issue discussed was Edward Snowden. And the chairman, Mike Rogers, asked the director of national intelligence, uh, uh, Mr. Clapper, about specifically what kind of damage did Snowden do. And there's a report out right now that because of Snowden's leaks, it will be harder to find IEDs, improvised explosive device, targeting our troops. He also said that it's clear that our enemies have gone to school on these leaks to find ways to evade detection by U.S. intelligence. Uh, Mr. Clapper also said that American officials and U.S. soldiers around the world are at significantly uh, more risk because of the Snowden leaks. You know, yesterday we just had uh, General Hayden on the show, a man I know you know very well. He was telling us that uh, we were comparing Bradley Manning's case with Edward Snowden, and uh, General Hayden made the point that Snowden, uh, his breach, is far more damaging, and this clearly backs up what General Hayden was saying here on this program yesterday. Um, you know, there's particularly this issue with IEDs. Did he, from what you heard today, uh, Fred, was it clear that while Snowden was releasing the, these, these classified documents that he knew specifically that he was going to put American troops at risk by, uh, you know, I guess, obscuring some of the information that could help uh, the bomb detection units find these IEDs? I, I think he knew very well they would be put, he would put American troops at risk, American officials at risk. And what happened at today's hearing is important because Snowden and his supporters keep claiming that Snowden has been careful not to leak anything that could put lives at risk. Now, I've known that that's untrue, but to have the, the Intelligence Committee chairman go point by point by point on all the instances where Americans being put at risk, I think it simply puts to lie to this claim that Snowden has, has, been, do, has been doing this out of a, some, some type of whistleblower role. He's, in fact, done a great deal of damage to this country that's going to put American lives at risk. Now, you also mentioned that the enemy is going to school or has gone to school on some of this information. You know, we don't want to put any more of this out there, but is there anything spe specifically you can tell us uh, that they are trying to capitalize on as we continue to deal with global terrorism? Well, they now know uh, ways that they can be followed. They now know electronic surveillance methods to avoid that, that the U.S. government has been using. They know some of these methods have been used to follow their finances. And it was made clear over and over again today by the testimony that, that our enemies know a great deal, and they specifically said terrorists, not simply nation-state terrorists, nation-state adversaries. They know a great deal about how to avoid detection by U.S. intelligence. Now, the folks who are still continuing to defend Snowden, I mean, they might say something like, hey, hey look, we've heard talk about a potential plea bargain. Maybe this is just uh, the U.S. and Mike Rogers trying to publicly make a case against Snowden uh, in the media because this was a, a, a hearing open to the public, and they're trying to present their case. Uh, you know, you didn't get that impression, though, when you, when you listened to the testimony from Clapper. Uh, neither Democrats or Republicans in this committee said anything about a plea bargain or that Snowden is a whistleblower or that he should be given any kind of easy way out and not pay for his crimes. I know there are radical Democrats on the Senate Intelligence Committee, particularly Senator Ron Wyden, who feel otherwise.
lives. But on the House Intelligence Committee, there was bipartisan agreement uh, that, that this man is a traitor and he should be held accountable for his crimes. All right, let's switch topics and uh, we'll, we'll have more uh, on the Snowden case. That's certainly to come up again. But Fred, while we still have you here, I want to ask you about one last topic, and that's the issue of increased sanctions uh, for Iran. We, you know, throughout the, the week, we've heard a little bit more bluster from Iran as well. Um, you know, what do you think is the more likely scenario six months down the road, that there's going to be progress on these nuclear negotiations or uh, there are going to be more economic sanctions put into place? The agreement that uh, we have struck with Iran is very vague, and it's it's going to be well, there's going to be disagreement over whether they have complied uh, with it with its uh, provisions. There is a, a a bill that the House is prepared to pass, and quite a few senators, although not a not a uh, filibuster-proof majority, are prepared to pass to pa to implement additional sanctions if, it, if Iran doesn't abide by the agreement. Those sanctions are never going to be implemented because there won't be enough votes in the Senate. And the president has threatened to veto it. In fact, uh, the, the Iranian foreign minister recently said he does not fear the U.S. Congress because he knows that President Obama will veto any new sanctions that might pass. But, Fred, if there's enough sentiment from the American public, if the Iranian officials keep saying these things, if they keep uh, rattling sabers, you know, would public opinion, will it factor in enough to kind of push, to, to, you know, to push the president's hand on this? Well, it, it looked as if... Uh, public opinion was really moving against the president, and there was almost enough senators for this to pass. In fact, almost enough for it to pass to, at, by a, um, to override a veto. But a number of Democratic sponsors have backed off recently because of intense pressure by President Bush, to, uh, President Obama, to say, don't interfere with the diplomatic process. Um, the Iranians, I, I think, are pretty savvy, and I don't think they're going to do anything really obvious that, that could drum up enough support to force the president's hand. All right, excellent insight from Fred Flights, uh, Fred Flights, I should say, the senior analyst for Lignet.com. Fred, always a pleasure to have you with us, and we'll have you back soon. My pleasure. All right, coming up later on America's Forum, we'll have uh, an interview, a special interview with former New York Governor George Pataki, what he has to say about Chris Christie's political future following the Bridgegate scandal, plus much more on America's Forum when our show continues. Mm -hmm.